Spent fuel remains a topic of great misunderstanding, and despite the efforts of many to shed light on this subject, most of it is inaccurate. Today we are going to examine a video made by Wendover Productions. I don't believe that the video is meant to be some kind of an anti-nuclear message, so I will go easy on this video and you may consider this an attempt to amend some of the inaccuracies of the video. Let's see what we can learn. Nuclear energy is one of the cleanest, most efficient, and most available sources of power on Earth. The begin is spot on. However, you can hear a but coming in the end. Let's continue. But that doesn't necessarily mean nuclear is the long-term solution for the world, because nuclear material is perhaps the most poisonous substance on Earth. No, this isn't true at all. There's plenty of stuff on the Earth that is deadlier than spent nuclear fuel. But Wendover Production uses this as a preface of what is to come. First, I will explain what nuclear waste is, and secondly, I will show you stuff that is far more deadly. Contemporary nuclear reactors run on low and rich uranium. Naturally occurring uranium predominantly consists of the uranium-238 isotope and less than 1% is uranium-235. Uranium-235 is fissile, which means that when it absorbs a neutron, it will split and release energy, fission products, and neutrons. And this is what we call a fission reaction. To get a sustained chain of fission reactions, you need to increase the percentage of uranium-235 in the fuel. This is called enrichment. We typically enrich fuel up to a point where it contains about 5% of uranium-235. After we have used the fuel for about 8 years, it is spent, which means that the uranium-235 content has become too low and the buildup of neutron poisons like xenon stops us from using the fuel any further. Remember that we had 95% of uranium-238 and 5% of uranium-235 at the beginning. Now, after 8 years, the composition has slightly changed. We might have around 94% uranium-238 and less than 2% of uranium-235. The remaining 4% is mainly fission products. Roughly 1% of the uranium-238 has absorbed neutrons and turned into transuranics like plutonium and neptunium. These are potentially deadly, mostly because they are heavy metals, and heavy metals in general are toxic. However, these are bound up in the solid fuel and unlikely to exit. All plutonium isotopes, apart from plutonium-242, which is a very rare product in a fission reactor, only emit alpha and beta particles, but no gamma radiation. And this is good, because that means that it is quite harmless, as long as you don't ingest or inhale any of it. Uranium-238 is harmless. I've held a pallet of pure depleted uranium, and a friend of mine walks around with it. Remember, 94% of this spent nuclear fuel is uranium-238. There's also other fission products in there that could be dangerous. Think about iodine, cesium, and strontium. But these elements are bound up in the fuel, and if undisturbed, won't come out. So why is spent nuclear fuel not dangerous? It is, firstly, it is handled with great care. It may still be hot, but it's pretty stable. And after 10 years, we can move it into another contemporary storage container, as you will see in the coming fragments, which is called dry cask storage. Volume-wise, spent nuclear fuel is tiny. All dry casks used to store it that are present on the planet, for instance, take up less space than two football fields. So what is deadlier than spent nuclear fuel? Mercury? Cadmium? Mercury is in the air thanks to coal burning. Lead is also pretty deadly, which is basically everywhere. And then we have the ubiquitous natural chemicals like sodium nitride, cyanide, botulinum, toxin, ricin, or plants like the odolam tree the autumn crocus, and wolvesbane, or animals like the pufferfish, the blue-ringed octopus, bad clams, frogs, scorpions, and snakes.
There are plenty of things on this planet that are pretty deadly. In fact, these are orders of magnitude more deadly than spent nuclear fuel. Having said all that, let's continue and see what Wendover has to say next. Two times in history have nuclear power plants leaked significant amounts of radiation. In 1986 in Chernobyl, Ukraine, and in 2011 in Fukushima, Japan. 31 people died in Chernobyl, with at least a further 4,000 expected to contract early lethal cancer due to radiation. The cancer that is expected as a result of the Chernobyl accident is thyroid cancer due to the ingestion of radioactive iodine-131. Luckily, this could be a lethal cancer, but the survival rate is generally higher than 90%. Fukushima was better contained, with only two deaths, both unrelated to radiation, and only 130 early cancer deaths expected. But, additionally, each site still today has massive exclusion zones where humans cannot live due to ongoing radiation. These are precautionary measures, but the funny thing here is that the Ukrainian exclusion zone around Chernobyl, countless of people have lived and still live today, and are thriving. Thousands of people work there, we see no increased rates of cancer, and generally, these people live to old ages. As a matter of fact, the Chernobyl exclusion zone has become a wildlife sanctuary, home to bison, wild boar, wolves, and even a herd of wild horses. In addition, uranium, the element most commonly used in nuclear reactors, is not in limitless supply. Using present-day extraction methods, there's only about a 230-year supply of uranium left. Uranium is virtually in limitless supply as it is omnipresent. It can be extracted from seawater, for instance. But also note that the amount of depleted uranium that is already unearthed and sitting in casks in Paducah, for instance, is a huge supply of uranium-238 which can be used in fast pretty reactors. In fact, we have so much spent nuclear fuel already which will last us for thousands of years in pretty reactors. We could also use a thorium-232, uranium-233 breeding cycle. As far as I can tell, we're set for the duration of the planet's lifetime. Many would say nuclear is only a short-term solution to reduce carbon emissions until truly sustainable energy can become commonplace. In terms of fuel efficiency, material usage, longevity, nuclear fission is the most sustainable form of energy on the planet, outmatching renewables like wind and solar by orders of magnitude when efficient use of materials is concerned. Apart from that, you are talking it through from the viewpoint of the light water reactor, which is a perfectly fine technology, but we have solid science and practical evidence to expand our nuclear activities in the realm of the breeder reactor. Consider for instance the sodium chloride fast breeder reactor by Elysium Industries. But the biggest problem with nuclear energy is not the risk of meltdown, it's not the supply of uranium, it's this, nuclear waste which is a fundamentally misunderstood facet of nuclear energy production. All current commercial nuclear power plants work through the process of nuclear fission. As a radioactive element decays, you probably mean splits or fissions. The individual atoms split into two, but when that happens, the reaction also releases energy. There are plenty of different designs of nuclear reactors, but in general they capture the released energy by using it to heat up water into steam which runs through turbines that spin generators. The nuclear element used is typically uranium, which, after about six to eight years of usage in a nuclear power plant, will have released enough of its energy that it is no longer useful in nuclear reactors. Wrong! it is no longer useful in light water reactors. That's a meaningful distinction. It contains isotopes that can be used for space exploration, for medicine, and for the creation of more energy, particularly the present uranium-235, the high volume of uranium-238, and the so-called transuranics. But that doesn't mean it's done emitting energy. The fuel rods will remain radioactive enough to emit a lethal dose for tens or hundreds of thousands of years past their removal. So the question is, what do you do with them? 
Here we uncover a fundamental misunderstanding. The half-life of uranium-235 is 703 million years. The half-life of uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years. And the transuranics have half-lives varying from 300 to millions of years. But all the quasi-dangerous fission products will be gone well before that. So basically, spent nuclear fuel remains dangerous for about a say. Spent nuclear fuel remains dangerous for a century, maybe two, and then it's just low radioactive isotopes that are left. The answer is simple. Put them somewhere where they can stay, undisturbed, isolated, forever. We don't want to store it forever, because we want to use what's in there. Spent nuclear fuel is literally a gold mine waiting for us to mine it. But that's not all that easy. In fact, no nuclear waste worldwide is currently in what is considered long-term storage. Once nuclear waste has cooled down in storage pools for 10 to 20 years, it typically is encased in casks. These concrete and steel containers block in radiation, but this solution is far from permanent. It does not consider earthquakes, it cannot withstand tsunamis. This is untrue and I quote straight from the NRC webpage. Dry cask storage is safe for people and the environment. Cask systems are designed to contain radiation, manage heat and prevent nuclear fission. They must resist earthquakes, projectiles, tornadoes, flood, temperature extremes and other scenarios. Therefore, long-term nuclear waste storage needs to last longer than any political structure, it needs to work without the supervision of humans, it needs to be truly and unequivocally permanent. Finland is building just that. This region is largely devoid of natural disasters. It doesn't have earthquakes, it doesn't see tsunamis, it really doesn't encounter any natural phenomenon that could damage a nuclear waste storage site, especially if it's 1500 feet underground. Beneath an island on the Finnish Baltic Sea coast, the country is digging. They're building the very first permanent nuclear waste storage facility in the world in the stable bedrock 1500 feet below. Currently, they're just finishing their dig down. Then very soon, in 2020, they'll start filling the facility with nuclear waste. They'll dig long tunnels with small holes in which they'll place casks of nuclear waste and backfill the tunnels with clay to be left for an eternity. Here I must repeat myself. This is not a smart thing to do. The best thing we could do with spent nuclear fuel is temporarily store it in dry cost containers so that we can retrieve it later to use in fast breeder reactors and to extract the valuable fission products that have significant uses in industry and medicine. Opening the nuclear storage facilities would release radiation into a future civilization. Opening one of these containers wouldn't register on a global scale. And since the products that are inside the casks aren't volatile, they won't get out. So we have to tell them to leave the sites alone. But that's easier said than done. The US Department of Energy commissioned a study on how to communicate the danger into the far future. The key is to create a message that conveys how uninteresting, how unimportant, and how dangerous nuclear waste is. On the contrary, it is fascinating, a possibility for more scientific knowledge, and the dangers are continuously exaggerated. And we need better communication on these issues, for the scourge of so-called nuclear waste looms, but it is, in fact, a golden opportunity. I think this video had some good elements, but also contained some errors. But most of all, it works on the premise that we must store spent nuclear fuel forever, which is not the case. Thank you all for watching and have a nice day.